emphasis in ministry, I think, is well known now. That I'm concerned not only that God's people or that men and women should become Christians, but that having become Christians, they should grow up into Christ in all things and enter into the fullness of life as it is possible for men and women to do in Christ. I'm going to ask you tonight to turn to Isaiah chapter 40. I'm not going to take time to give you background on chapter 40. I'm sure that most of the ministers have already done that in your churches. Chapter 40 is the beginning of the great evangelical part of the prophet Isaiah. At this time of the year, you'll be starting to hear parts of it sung. But I only want to take a look at the last four verses, commencing with verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They that wait upon the Lord. Through the grace of God, it is possible for men and women who are sinners and rebels against God, who are on the way to a, a lostness that is horribly described in the Bible as the blackness of darkness forever, that such persons can be arrested by the grace of God and brought into a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, having their lives transformed at the very root and foundation of their being. So from what they were to what they are is the distance between darkness and light, hell and heaven, lostness and salvation. But having come into that living relationship, they now have opportunity to have their lives so conditioned and developed and transformed that they become in very deed and in every area of their lives people who are like Christ. As you read the Bible, you'll notice that the Holy Spirit has ransacked, literally, all of nature to find illustrations by which to describe and portray great truths. There is hardly a thing that you and I can mention tonight that is not found in the Bible as a vehicle of the Holy Spirit to transmit some truth. Mountains, streams, stars, the sun, the moon, the flowers, the grass, man, woman, children, family relationships, human relationships, kings, queens, mighty men, captains, children, babies, young people, Think of anything, think of anything, buildings, farms, anything you can think of, you'll find it in the Bible. The Holy Spirit has laid hold upon it to transmit some truth to men that they may the better understand. For there is a sense in which we are dull of hearing at best. And the Holy Spirit very graciously uses everything at hand by which to tell you what God wants for you. And remember, what God wants for you is always best for you. The law of God is not a thing designed to hurt you. It's a thing designed to help you. And to show you that the most exquisite pleasures are enjoyed within the disciplines of law. And that when you break those laws, the things that you think can be enjoyed by the breaking of the laws suddenly turn sour in your mouth. 
so that the law is not designed to make you unhappy. It's a way of telling you how to handle your life so that it will be a happy, worthwhile life, that in the end it will be crowned with the glory of his well done. But tonight I want to talk about only one of these many, many illustrations in the Bible. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. It's an interesting thing that the king of birds, the eagle, and the king of animals, the lion, are both related to the king of kings, the Lord Jesus. Jehovah brought Israel out of Egypt on eagles' wings. And it's the lion of the tribe of Judah that took the scroll and broke the seals to bring redemption to lost mankind. And as he is, so are we, so that he, our Lord, who is the great preeminent eagle, gives us of his nature. And he who is the lion gives us of his nature. Speaking specifically of the eagle, used as it is in the Bible, it refers, of course, to the eagle in the Middle East of which there are two kinds, the imperial and the golden. Imperial speaks, of course, of kingship. Golden speaks of deity. And so when the Bible likens you and me to eagles, it says that we are divine kings. This is exactly what Romans 5, 17 says. We reign in life by one Christ Jesus. We are kings, but you reply to me, Baxter, you're wrong. That sounds all very fine, but I'm no eagle. I am no king. I'm not reigning. I'm defeated. I am here tonight hanging on by the skin of my teeth. Then it's to you I want to speak. As you wait upon the Lord, as you give yourself to him, he will build into you the divine ability, and you'll take on Christ-likeness in every area of your life not just one or two, but you will become verily and indeed an eagle. But you must wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. The writer to the Proverbs said, there be four things too wonderful for me, the way of a man with a maid, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of an eagle in the air. The way of a man with a maid is the thing was read tonight. It's the mystery of Christ in the church. The way of a serpent on the rock is the mystery of iniquity, the relationship of Satan to the rock Christ Jesus. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea is the mystery, the mystery of the continuity of the church in the midst of the world, how it has survived. It's mysterious indestructibility down through the centuries with all hell let loose to break it, the little ship of the church bounces across the waters of history, making its way to the other side. The way of an eagle in the air is what we're talking about tonight. The mystery of a man in a rotten, crooked, perverse world who can mount up and live a life that is holy and pure and powerful. These things can only be understood by the grace of God. Ah, you say, I want that. How do you get it? I'll tell you. It starts out by being born into the right family. You have to be born into the eagle family. Every Christian is born into the eagle family. When you're born into the eagle family, that makes you a baby eagle. Or you're an eaglet. Now in Deuteronomy 32:11, we have a very graphic description of how eaglets become eagles. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovering over its young, spreading its wings to catch them and bearing them on its pinion. What's that all about? Well, undoubtedly Moses as a shepherd had watched the training of eaglets, thrust out of their nest, hurled from the sheer rock, then the mother swooping down as they struggled, bearing them up, letting them go again, so repeatedly. So God trained Israel, and so God still trains us. See if this doesn't sound familiar to you. When you first became a Christian, it was all light and roses. It was marvelous. 
God changed your life, filled you with the Holy Spirit. It was hoop, hurrah, and hallelujah. This is wonderful. You liked it. It was great. But what you didn't realize was that you were in for some surprises. The little eaglet, as it nestles there in the beautiful edifice that has been built for it, and how it's been built, way up in the eerie heights, the little eaglet, maybe two of them in an air. This is great. Mom brings gastronomical tidbits. Little bits of rabbit prepared and drops it into the little gaping beaks. Life was never so good. It's wonderful to be an eaglet. And they snuggle a little more comfortably into the warm lining of the parental home. Here comes mom again with another tidbit and the mouths open. Mom drops it in. This is great. Until one day mom does something very strange. As she comes in for a landing, instead of landing as usual, she just hovers over the nest, just hovers, this giant bird. And the little eaglets look up and they say, boy, mom sure got powerful wings. That's exactly what mom wants to imply. She's telling them how strong she is. She's giving them a display of her strength. Having done that, the next thing she does is that she starts to act very strangely. She comes over with her great beak and she reaches down and grabs a hunk of the nest with her beak and yanks it loose and deliberately goes over to the edge of the sheer cliff and drops it over. The little eaglets are watching the whole procedure with some discomfort and concern. Mom comes back and grabs another hunk of the nest and drops it over. After she's done this a few times, the, the scaffolding of the nest is starting to come through. The great twigs, the great branches of the trees, and the little eaglets can't find a comfortable spot. There is the linings getting taken out of the nest. Things aren't like they were. Getting uncomfortable now. And when it's so uncomfortable that there isn't any spot where the little eaglets can settle down without something sticking into them, now comes the grand finale. For Mother Eagle comes over and she nudges the little eaglet out and she moves it toward the cliffside. The little eaglet said, no, me. She wouldn't. She wouldn't. She will. <laughs> and she dies. And the little eaglet gets right over the edge and she pushes him. The little guy says, I don't understand it. She's always been so good to me, brought meals right on time, kept the nest warm. Now she's trying to kill me. And the little guy flops down. <laughs> this is the end. It was beautiful while it lasted when suddenly he hears the whir of mighty wings and out of the corner of his eye he sees mom with those great wings that she demonstrated over the nest as she swoops down and takes him on her back and bears him up again and drops him gently off beside the remnants of the nest. The little guy said, oh, that was a close one. He's just getting her bre his breath when she repeats it and nudges him, he said, oh my God, no, not again. <laughs> and once more, she thrusts him over. And again, the little guy goes flopping down. About three or four of those, and he begins the idea that she's telling him something. And he realizes he's got some things of his own. <laughs> and he figures he better climb or he's going to get killed. Now you laugh, but there's a great truth there. If you don't learn to fly, you may, in a very real sense, be a casualty. You'll never learn to fly. Because I'm going to tell you something, God is going to put you in that situation again and again and again, and you're either going to learn to fly or you're going to become a spiritual casualty. 
So I asked the little bird, because he says, I, I, I got some of those things right Mom's got. I'm going to try them out. And it's a little wobbly, that first ride, but hallelujah, he can fly. <laughs> how many know anything about this in experience? Come on, how many have experienced this? Getting put out of the net. Come on, be honest. Sure. Things aren't like they were when I was first saved. Well, now, when I was first saved, I don't know, it just isn't the same. Of course it isn't the same. You want to live in diapers all your life? You want, you want to live on a bottle all your life? You want to be a child forever? There comes growing up time, and God helps you with that. Listen to me. God is more interested in your character than in your comfort. We've all equated God with Santa Claus. He comes with a big bag of goodies and hands them out. And we say, God is a good God. Mm, the good things he's given me. God is a good God. Because God is a good God, God isn't like Santa Claus. And God isn't like some of us indulgent parents either. God is interested in building character. Therefore, God doesn't give you everything you want. God gives you what is best for you. He is the Father of light, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow caused by turning. And he's concerned for your character. And he's not going to give you two cars in every garage and two chickens in every pot and all the rest of it. Not, not God. An indulgent parent may do that and then wonder why his son finishes up an alcoholic or his daughter finishes up with a bad marriage. But God is not that way. God is concerned in you and me growing up into the likeness of Christ. Therefore, as a good God and a good father, he will force us to use the divine means and graces that he has given us that we may grow up and become responsible men and women in the kingdom of God. Now the Bible says many things about the eagle. That's the way the eagle gets his training. That's the way he gets his start. God forces him to take responsibility. God forces him to stop being a baby. God says, it's time now for you to grow up. It wouldn't be fair of God to not force us to grow up. The Bible says about the eagle that it nests very high. Jeremiah tells us that about the height of the eagle, the nest is as high as the eagle. And then in Obadiah 4 we read, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars. Job says, She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, and the strong place. Eagle Christians are made for high places. They live high. They sit in heavenly places in Christ. Christians who are eagle Christians, mature Christians, don't grub around down in the dirt. But they maintain the dignity of their sonship. They're seated in heavenly places in Christ. They walk with the poise and dignity of the sons of God. There's nothing cheap or chintzy about an eagle Christian. There's nothing small or petty or squabbling about an eagle Christian. He will not stoop from the dignity of his kingship. He lives high, way up above all the other birds. His nest is set on high. You and I, as mature Christians, are seated with Christ in the heavenly. We act like Christ. We will not stoop the small and petty thing. We will manifest the dignity of our co-rulership with our Lord Jesus. 
The habits of an eagle are beautiful. We've already referred to the way of an eagle in the air. You know, it's interesting how science slowly catches up to the Bible. While the Bible is not a textbook on science, whenever it taxes on facts of nature, science eventually gets around to validating it. It says that mount up as eagles. You'll notice it didn't say we fly up as eagles. Eagles don't fly. The way of an eagle in the air is different to any other bird. They act differently. An eagle mounts up. He doesn't fly up. Why? Because an eagle knows something. An eagle has an inbuilt understanding of the air current. He knows how to handle the air current. And they say there's nothing more exciting than an eagle that takes off as it sits there with its mighty talons gripping the side of a rock and it's sensing the moving of the spirit, I mean the wind. And suddenly, as the wind blows just right, it lets out one mighty scream and it leaps from that rock and it catches that breeze and it rides it. I'll tell you why it can ride it, because it has cylindrical bones. When you're an eagle Christian, it's in your bones. You just have to fly. You can't help it. It's built in ability. So the eagle catches it, and he rides it. And he rides it. I've watched him in the Columbian Basin in the western United States, those mighty birds, as they fly or mount or float up and down the basin without even the movement of their wings, just catching each breeze as it comes along. And as they moved up and down that basin, they were saying to all the other birds, I'm king. I know something. There is something built into me that lets me ride the air current. Oh, other birds are different. Other birds, they flap around, make a lot of, you know. You see, there are a lot of Christians that do that. Last God, I'm going to do this and hallelujah. I tell you, I've made up my mind. You made up your mind to what? Well, bless God, I'm going to be like Christ. You look like a crow to me. <laughs> that isn't the way it's done. The Bible says that if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We live in the Spirit. We don't have to flap and make a great racket. Catch the meaning of a meeting. You don't have to be stirred up. What is the spirit doing? What is the breeze? Aha. All right, let's start the mound on it. That's the way they did in the early church. Listen to an eagle meeting described by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then? How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done. Let all things be done. Let all things be done unto edifying. What does that mean? That means that eagle Christians sense the wind, and they ride on the spirit. They don't create the wind, they ride on the wind. Another thing is that they, they love a storm. An eagle loves a storm. When a storm is gathering, you see all the other birds scurrying for cover. Not the eagle. Man, he stands there batting his eyes. He says, glory to God, here comes a storm. Hallelujah. He loves the storm. Man, he's going to get air currents in that storm. He never gets every day. <laughs> Is he going to have a ride today? Here comes a good one. Go away to God. And the lightning flashes and the thunder rolls. And now the wind strikes. And he gets a good one. And away he goes. And all the other birds are watching. <laughs> I came out of my home in Vancouver one morning years ago, and I heard a very strange sound. Down on the pavement at the foot of the stairs, a 
I saw a little bee, and it was going, boom, boom. And every time it would boom, it would go round, round, round. I go, what's the matter with that bee? So I got down real close, and I looked at it, and I found that that poor little bee had had an accident, and he'd lost one wing. And he only had one wing. So that when he used that one wing, he just went, <laughs> Let your prayer be with thanksgiving. Prayer and praise must go together. Some people only pray all the time. <laughs> Other people are all night. When you pray, but cannot get your answer through, when you get discouraged, know not what to do, cease to beg and plead, but hallelujahs raise. Your petition shall ascend on wings of praise. Rise and soar into the sunlight rays, using both your wings of prayer and praise. Mount like eagles high in the sky, and you find things look so different when you fly. Many baffled birds will only wave one wing. Drooping prayers they pray, but rarely shout and sing. Round and round these earthbound birds go in a maze, for they fail to stretch the other wing in praise. Some neglect to pray and only shout around. Like the beaten brass or cymbal, so they sound. They too tread a circle and will never share the much larger life on wings of praise and prayer. On the ground, the view restricted in the way stand a hundred hindrances that will dismay. There you fret and fuss and flurry, go up high. God will soon enlarge your vision as you fly. Rise and soar into the sunlight rays, using both your wings of prayer and praise. Mount like eagles high in the sky, and you'll find things look so different when... You fly. Listen. Exercise your wings, O oh Christians. Pray and praise. We shall have the best revival these last days. Glide aloft and spread the message glad and strong. See ten thousand angels swarm and Swell the song, sing it with me now. Rise and soar into the sunlight rays, using both your wings. You a prayer and praise. Mount like eagles. High in the sky. And you'll find things look so different. When you fly, once more now rise and soar into the sunlight rays, using both your wings of prayer and praise. Mount like eagles, mount like eagles, high in the sky. Sky. And you'll find things look so 
different when you fly. Hallelujah. Let's say hallelujah. hallelujah. Who wants to live down here? You know another thing about that, while you're on the way up, you'll find a bunch of old black crows sitting along the telephone wire. And they'll say, call, call, call. If you'll stop by here, we'll give you the latest gossip about the pastor. Call, call, call. We got some juicy tidbits about the church secretary too. Just stop by. Call, call, call. Eagles have no time for lesser birds. <laughs> the eagle has two sets of eyelids. One that it uses when it's on the ground and the other one it uses when it's flying into the sun. Because the eagle loves to fly into the sun. He likes to look at the sun. And so God's equipped him with an extra set of eyelids and he just drops them down to safeguard his vision as he looks at the sun. God has given you and me two sets of eyelids. He's given us a set of eyelids for our earth walk. And he's given us a set of eyelids for our worship walk. A lot of Christians only want to worship. A lot of other Christians only want to walk. But the eagle Christian knows how to have a conscience void of offense toward God and man. He's got two sets of eyelids. Some Christians are so spiritual they're no earthly good. The most practical man in the world is a Christian. That's why the Psalms and the Proverbs go together. If you read five psalms every morning and one chapter of the Proverbs, you'll read the psalms and the Proverbs through every month. The psalms will tell you how to fly into the sun. The Proverbs will tell you how to behave in the earth. You need them both. I've met many very spiritual people, quote, who are very stupid people, quote. The eagle is a great fighter. Job 39, 29 says that from her high and strong nest she seeketh the prey and her eyes behold afar off. She's got keen spiritual perception. When you live the eagle life, you live close to the throne of God. You take on the characteristics of God. You have to have comprehension. When I first realized that I had the right to the life of Jesus and that I was to follow him as my example, one of the first things I did was start to check out his life to find out what I could have. And I found this. The Bible said that he did not commit himself to man because he knew what was in him. I said, God, I want the eagle's perception. I want to be able to see afar off. I want to see what's behind a man's facade. I never listen to a man when he's talking to me. I feel his spirit. They think they're fooling me. Many times they smile at me as they talk. And they say pretty things. And their spirit is all sour inside. They don't know that I know. They just wonder why I'm not taken in by their flattery. They wonder why I don't accept their rationale. They don't know why I'm not impressed with their sense of self-importance. Their words are not really what they are. Their words are a camouflage, a facade. Their spirit is what counts. And so I turn on my perceptor and I listen in to their spirit. And I find that when their spirit is talking to me, it's not saying what their mouth is saying. This is one of the advantages of growing up. You don't be gullible. You don't be deceived because you become perceptive. You read a man's spirit. 
I've had men smile at me and say things to me, and they were lying to me. They didn't know that I knew they were lying, but their spirit was telling me that what they really meant was not what was coming out of their mouths, it was what was coming out of their spirit. Then they wonder why I'm not impressed. It's because I can see you far off. I'm looking away down the corridor of their spirit, away down into the soul of their personality, and I'm seeing what they're really thinking. And you all have the right to that if you want to grow up. Sometimes an eagle's life gets very lonely, however, because the higher you fly, the more you fly out of the sphere of lesser birds. And the closer you come to God, the more distinctively you cultivate his friendship. But the eagle sees his prey from a long distance, and he hastens to it, and he has one enemy, and that one enemy is the snake, the serpent. That's the enemy that he detests. That's the enemy that makes its way up the craggy heights and slips into the eagle's nest and robs the egg. When the eagle sees a snake, he hates a snake with perfect hatred. It is his enemy. The snake, as you know, is a type of Satan. And when he sees, the Bible says he hastes to the prey. He doesn't wait to have a conversation with anybody. He sees that snake and he's after it. When you see the devil moving in your life, you don't wait to have a chat with him. You move in. And the eagle has two ways of killing a snake. One way is that he pecks him to death. He just pecks him to death. What does that mean? Well, that means you just take the word of God and peck him to death. Now, if, you, if your beak isn't that strong today, there's another way that the eagle has of killing the snake. He picks it up in his beak and he flies away up high until he gets over a nice big craggy rock. And he drops him. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Just pick that devil up and drop him on Jesus. When an eagle is caught and put in a cage, he's the dirtiest bird in captivity. But when he's free, he's clean. An eagle Christian that is put in a cage of legalism becomes a dirty bird. There are all kinds of Christians that are dirty birds, and they're made dirty birds by preachers and teachers that put them in religious cages and takes away their freedom. They're not built for that kind of thing. They're not built to be cramped up and caged in. They're built for freedom. They're built for idea current. They're built to go screaming into the sun. You tie them up, they'll dirty their own cage. They'll foul their own nest because it's against their nature. People wonder why Christians turn sour and become introverted. Christians weren't made for legalism. They weren't made for laws and, and the rules of government that are pressure them and make them do this and that because they got to. They've got their got to inside. It's the intuition of the Spirit. It's the power of the indwelling Christ. Set a Christian free and he'll be clean. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stay free. I wouldn't sell my freedom for all the tea in China or for all the ecclesiastical gifts that man could give me. Since the day I have found freedom in Christ, it's the most precious thing I've got. Eagles are Christians who know clean freedom. I talked to a minister one time. He says, I believe in five raptures. I said, that's interesting. 
Which one do you plan on going up in? <laughs> oh, he said, I'm sure I'll make the first one. I said, I thought so. All of you fellows do. You keep the other four to beat the saints with. Priestcraft is not dead. The Bible very clearly says that there are those who would rob you of your freedom. They will sanctimoniously quote church laws and canon laws and do's and don'ts. What they really want to do is rob you of your freedom. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. They tried to take an eagle a few hundred years ago and cage him up. But that eagle by the name of Luther wouldn't be caged. And he not only flew out of the cage himself, but he took a lot with him. And down through the centuries, there's been eagles that have led the way to new freedoms. Because Satan is back of the caging system. He's out to capture eagles. God's out to set them free. An eagle has the power of renewal. When an eagle is sick or molting, he goes and gets on a rock in the sun. And he just sits on the rock in the sun. How do you like that for a double metaphor? He sits on Christ and basks in Christ. And he just waits on the Lord. And as he waits on the Lord, he grows his new feathers. He doesn't make a big thing about it. He just gets to the Lord. He said, Lord, I'm not feeling well. I need a renewal of strength. And he feels the firmness of the rock beneath him and the warmth of the sun upon him. And he feels the healing stimulus of the combination as his feathers begin to grow again. And he looks forward to another day when he'll mount up once more. An eagle has faith. The eagle is one of the few birds that lays their eggs in the snow. I've been a pastor for over 20 years and I thank God for every eagle Christian that ever laid eggs on the snow of our prayer room floor. There are two classes of Christians in churches, the get-outers and the get-downers. When things go tough, a lot of people get out. Others get down. I thank God for godly women that have filled the prayer rooms of the churches where I've been. When the going was tough, when we were going through crisis, when hell was trying to break in upon us, these godly people would gather and they'd lay their prayer eggs on the cold snow of our frigid condition. Why? They believed that the God of the seasons would bring a spiritual spring as sure as he lived and the warm sun would incubate the eggs. They believed that God was the God of life. He was the God of Easter. He was the God who would take an egg laid in the snow and bring the inevitable warm spring to incubate it. That's one of the things I'm doing. I'm laying eggs in the snow. I'm laying eggs in the snow of a thousand frigid, rigid ecclesiastical laws where people say, it can't happen, Baxter, it can't happen. You and your talk about unity, you and your talk about the church coming to perfection and maturity. Since I've come to this country, I've had a man go on record as saying that. He says, I'm creating Ishmael's, I'm creating nothing. I haven't asked to create a thing. I haven't told anybody to do anything. All I'm saying is that Jesus Christ prayed that we should be one as he and the Father are one. If that's creating an Ishmael, then I don't understand the Bible. But I'm laying my eggs in the snow because I believe that as sure as God has spoken that his word is pre-written history. And as sure as God lives, the hour will come by a miracle of his grace and his power when the body of Christ will come together in holy oneness and I'm laying eggs in the snow tonight. I'm doing more than that. I'm laying eggs in the young hearts of these young men and women 
It's the generation of young people that I'm looking at across the world that are going to bring this vision to pass. Probably the majority of our generation will die in the wilderness. Never been an age like this for young people. I've loved them right from the beginning. I watched them as they became hippies and yippies. I knew what they were doing. They were crying out against the double standard, the duplicity and the hypocrisy of our day. And they went on that trip, and they went on the drug trip, and they went on the sex trip, and they found no answers. And then Jesus came, and the hippies, hundreds and thousands of them, became just Jesus people. And I loved them, and I taught them, and I had the honor of many of them in my part of the country calling me father because I put my manuals on the streets and they studied them in the streets of the city. And I'd go to cities for meetings where there'd be conservative churches sponsoring me. And I'd watch them coming in, in their granny dresses, and all of their get up, the Jesus people. And they'd come in and they'd fill the building. And they changed the whole atmosphere of the meeting. And I remember I went to one city, to a very conservative church, and I started on a Monday night. And the Jesus people weren't there. And I said, what have I done? Where are they? And the next night they all come trooping in, into the gallery, down the aisles, waving at me as they come in. I could see the conservative minister sitting beside me, raising his eyebrows. I went to them after and I said, where were you last night? They said, we didn't know you were here last night. We just heard today, here we are. These young people will put a knapsack on their back. They'll take a crust of bread and they'll cross the desert for Jesus Christ. My generation had to have their expenses paid. They had to have a call to a good church. They sorted out their letters to see whether they would or they wouldn't. We've got a generation of young people now that are prepared to sacrifice for the vision. And young people, I want to tell you, the vision is Christ's vision. And you're the generation that's going to make it work. And I put it in your hot young hearts tonight. And I say, let it percolate. Get out in the highways and the byways of human ideas. Speak the truth with your youthful energy. Young men, you're not only the young men and women that are going to build God's kingdom, you're the ones that are going to carry the Ananiases and the Sapphires out of the church. For the Bible says that it was the young men who carried out the bodies of Ananias and Sapphira. You clear out the must and the smell and the cobwebs and you build a brave new world. That's what you'll do. Put your shoulders back. Young people, you're our hope. An eagle dies looking into the sun. When he knows the time has come to die, he sets himself in those last moments and turns his old head for he lives to a ripe old age. Looking into the sun, he dies. That's the way eagles die. I knew an eagle once, the most beautiful eagle I ever knew. She was my maternal grandmother. She was a beautiful eagle. When I was a young lad, I rebelled against my home. I rebelled against the rigors of its discipline. It was my grandmother who reached out with a steadying hand. When I'd come in from a night of sin and wickedness, I'd have to go by her bedroom with a soft bed lamp on. I'd have to go through the awful agony of hearing her whisper my name before God. And then when God got a hold of my life and transformed it, there wasn't a happier eagle in the world than my grandma. When God gave me a church at the Pacific Coast, she moved out just to be with me. She'd sit right down about there with a the lady with the orange dress in. I don't think she ever heard a word I said. She'd just sit there and look at me. Sometimes I thought I saw her lips moving, and I thought I heard her saying, 
We did it, Lord. And then one day I went to visit her. I used to love to visit her. And I'd phone her up and I'd say, Grandma, I'm coming over for lunch. And she knew I liked little green peas and sliced pineapple. And whatever else she served, there'd be little green peas and sliced pineapple. And oh, how I loved her. Now I knew that four hours every day she sat in a rocking chair and interceded for me. I appreciated it, but I didn't need it. She didn't really have to bother because I was very clever. I was quite capable of getting along. My sermons were homiletically sound, hermeneutically correct. I had good introductions and fine endings. You'd never know it now, but I did back there. <laughs> While I appreciated the kindness of her prayers, I really didn't need them. This day I went to visit her and this grand old eagle said, I'm going home. I said, what do you mean home? You are home. She said, no, I mean I'm going home to heaven. It was like she was making an announcement by mutual agreement with the Almighty. And I almost think she was. She said, I'm going home to heaven. I said, no, you can't. You, you mustn't. Oh, she said, I'm 83 and I feel the time has come. I've given notice. I'm giving up my room at the end of the month. I will go back to the prairies and I'll spend Christmas with the family and then I'll go. She went back home, wrote out all her Christmas cards, called the preacher in. That's the proper thing to do, you know, when you're dying. Asked him to read her favorite psalm and she was two verses ahead of him by memory, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> when she had attended to everything, like an old patriarch, she just went home. An eagle. The Sunday following her death, I got up in my pulpit. By now I had a large, large congregation. I was known as something of a preacher. I wouldn't have mentioned it, you know, but I knew it also. <laughs> and I got up this Sunday morning with my well-prepared message and I cleared my throat for the great introduction and nothing came. And I tried again, and nothing came. And the Holy Spirit says, you've been a young smart aleck, haven't you? You don't know what you've lost. And I said, oh God, I do. And suddenly in front of my congregation, I fell over the pulpit and I began to sob. And I said, I've been an ungrateful, proud young man. I said, four hours every day, my mother, my grandmother prayed for me, and she's gone. And this morning, I'm so poor. And as I threw myself over the pulpit in sobs, we had one old colored sister in our church. We don't have many black people up in our part of the country, just one old colored sister. Her name was Sister Bino. Sister Bino stood up in the great congregation and she said, Pastor, I'll be your grandma. I said, Thank you, Sister Bino. I accept that. In those days, I was traveling across the world. I'd preach on Sunday morning. I'd be gone Sunday afternoon. I wouldn't be back maybe for a couple or three weeks. But every time it, it was announced that I was leaving and I'd go to the vestry after the service, there'd be old Mother Bino. And she'd take me into her ample bosom and she'd put that old black cheek down alongside of my pale white cheek. And she'd say, now you remember, son, wherever you go, remember that back home you've got a grandma. When Sister Bino went, I got another one. I've got grandmas all over the world tonight. I had a little 15-year-old girl come up to me recently and she said, Dr. Baxter, this may sound strange, but after you told that story, I was wondering, could I be your grandma?
I got young grandmas, old grandmas, middle-aged grandmas. I'd rather have a praying grandma than a sponsoring millionaire. A sponsoring millionaire can put me under obligation, but a praying grandma can get me all the things I need in God. Eagles die looking into the sun. Rise and soar into the sunlight rays. Using both your wings of prayer and praise, mount like eagles, higher in the sky. You'll find things look so different when you fly. How many want to be better people tonight? How many want to be better people tonight? Come on, better than you've been. Better than you've been. You want to fly higher than you've ever flown before. Hallelujah. Up where the air is rare. Get out of the small, get out of the bondage, fly high, bless your heart. Shall we bow our hearts in prayer? We thank you, our Father, for the gift of thy Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who became man of very man and came down for us men and for our salvation. We thank thee that through his dying on the cross and by the shedding of his blood that he bore away our sins and by his resurrection he became a prince and a savior to give eternal life to all who would obey him. We thank thee also that thou hast given us the Holy Spirit by which we can become like him even now in this life that we may mount up with wings as eagles that we can know the life of overcoming, the life on wings, the life in the rare atmosphere of heaven's glory. Oh God, stir hearts tonight. I'm not asking tonight, Father, for some emotional decision that is made under the heat and pressure of sentiment, but I'm asking for young men and young women who down in their hearts tonight will say, God being my helper, I will give my life to him irrevocably and without reservation. I'm asking tonight for mothers and fathers who will say by the grace of God we're going to find each other on a higher level of Christ's life. I'm asking tonight for old men and old women who feel that they have spent their days and there's nothing left but waiting for death. Oh God, I would gather them into one mighty prayer army. Give me a hundred grandmothers tonight, Father. Give me a hundred grandfathers Oh God, let the old men and the old women bind their hearts in holy prayer packs. May they pray the glory of God into the nations. Let the young and the old and the in-between become the army of the Lord and march across this nation, up and down the corridors of the earth until the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Great God, this is your world. Christ died for it. Holy Spirit, do you take it through us, the army of the Lord. My emphasis in ministry, I think, is well known now that I'm concerned 